Um, before I begin, I'd like to thank the conference organisers for this amazing conference. I've been really enjoying all the presentations so far. Um, my presentation is going to look at some work from a current project that I've been working on that's titled Can To Be Destroyed. And Can To Be Destroyed is going to be published next year by Shield Publishing, and the book's edited by Val Williams. And the project's also going to be exhibited next year at the Schulz Museum in Berlin. Um, and that exhibition is going to be co-curated by Val Williams and Robin Silas Christian. But in this paper, what I'm going to do is to look at just one aspect of this project. And what I'll do is begin by giving a background to this paper. The project came about because my brother, sister, and I inherited a family archive of letters, photographs, and papers from our mother, Audrey. And this archive tells the story of Ken and Hazel, my uncle and aunt, and how early on in their marriage it came to light that Ken was transgender. And it was in 2011, after our mother Audrey had moved into a nursing home, that my brother, sister and I found the archive. And it was when we had to clear her house because she'd moved into the nursing home. And finally, the archive was amazing. I'd had absolutely no idea that it existed. And the first thing I was really drawn to in the archive was a collection of letters that my Aunt Hazel had written to my mother, who was her older sister, in 1954, from 1950, sorry, from 1958 to um, about five years later. And Hazel, my aunt, had married Ken in 1954. And the letters were from when she first discovered that Ken was transgender. And she was really shocked. And she wrote to my mother asking for advice and help, not really knowing how she should cope with this or what to do about it. And this collection of letters that are really, for me, they were very moving because I felt I got to know both my aunt and my mother in a way that I'd never known them. And um, my mother was very supportive. My mother was incredibly supportive, and my aunt was writing in the context of the 1950s when very little was known about being transgender. And they really brought that to light. I think these letters really kind of gave the feel of that time. Um, and the difficulties that both Hazel and Ken faced in terms of trying to come to terms with the fact that Ken was transgender in the context of their marriage and in the context of society at that time because there was almost no support available. And by the end of the correspondence in 1963, it seems that from the letters that Hazel had come to terms with the fact that Ken was transgender. Um, and the archive contains in total 93 letters. Um, and the photographs that you see here are just some of the letters from Hazel to, to Audrey. And these photographs are from a collaboration that um, I made with Graham Goldwater to record the archive. And Graham Goldwater took these photographs. The letters and papers were found in a brown paper bag and two large brown envelopes. And on one of the envelopes, Audrey had written, Ken to be destroyed. On the other envelope, she'd written Ken's letters to Hazel to be destroyed. And on the bag, letters from Hazel re Ken. And so the image you see here is my mother Audrey's writing on one of the envelopes. And what was really interesting to me sometime later, when I realized that there were all these different materials in this archive, was the fact that despite what my mother had written on the envelopes and bag, she had first of all collect and, uh, kept in the 1950s all of Hazel's letters to her about Ken. She'd also kept carbon copies and notes from her letters to Hazel. Then when Hazel died in 2003, Audrey had gone to Edinburgh to sort out Hazel's things and she'd come across a collection of letters and cards that Ken had written to Hazel, which Hazel had kept. And my mother also found Ken's papers from the 1950s and 1960s when he was investigating what it meant to be transgender. 
And she then brought all of these things from Edinburgh and she put them together with her own collection of letters. So I feel at the moment now, thinking through that, that um, Audrey had probably been ambivalent about this material. On the one hand, she kept it, some of this material for over 50 years. And that on, yet on the other hand, she wrote on the envelopes that the contents were to be destroyed. And something that might connect to this is the fact that Audrey kept diaries and notebooks throughout her life. And she'd always intended for these to be written up for publication. So perhaps she thought that she might use some of this material. Um, but unfortunately, by the time I began to really explore the archive, it was too late to ask her. So Ken and Hazel married in 1954, and Hazel had worked as a dental secretary, and Ken practiced as an optician ed in Edinburgh. After they married, Hazel went to work part-time in Ken's optician shop. From the letters, I learned that from childhood, Ken had known that he was transgender. As a teenager, he'd collected and made girls' clothing, and he hid them in secret force drawers and dressed as a girl when his parents were out. When Ken married Hazel, he believed that he'd managed to put aside his feelings of being transgender. But this wasn't to be, and by 1958, he realised that he was going to have to tell Hazel about it. Despite the difficulties that Ken and Hazel faced in their marriage because of Ken being transgender, the marriage does appear to have been based on love and affection, and they remained together from 1954 to the end of Ken's life in 1979 but they didn't have any children. At the same time as discovering the archive, I also came across the family photograph albums, and amongst them, there was a set of Ken and Hazel's wedding photographic proofs. And the picture you see here is one of these, and you can see the word proof written across on the bottom of the picture. For me, the word proof is very interesting in the context of the archive and also very interesting in the context of the family photographs. And that's something I'm going to return to later on. Amongst the photographs, there was also a set of pictures of Hazel from the 1950s that had been taken by Ken. In the photographs, Hazel looks very glamorous, posing alone in a beautiful dress, hat, shoes and gloves in public gardens, beside a lake and in other settings. And five of these photographs, as you see here, were mounted together on a single album page. And on the back of the photographs, Ken had written where the pictures had been taken. So here, on the right of the screen, you can see in Ken's writing the words Hazel on Pier of Tea Garden, Alphaston, which is on the back of the photograph that you see on the left. I didn't discover the writing on the reverse of the photographs until in 1940. To, oh, sorry, in 2014, I was working with Robin Silas Christian on an exhibition of the early stages of the Ken to be Destroyed project, which was being held at the Photography and the Archive Research Centre at LCC. And we took one of the photographs very carefully out of its corner holders just to see if anything was written on the back. And it was really thrilling to then look online and find images of the places that connected to the places where these photographs had been taken in Scotland. Looking at the surfaces of the photographs in the albums, I was acutely aware of these surfaces. The marks of time and damage had become a part of the images. And the slide you see here is a detail from one of the album photographs. And the print itself has a remarkable surface with mold and scratches and tears. And you can even see a thumbprint on the lower right side of this image. And so I began with this archive by working with some of the photographs, producing photograms in the darkroom, and then scanning both these and the original photographs at high resolution. And the scans, when seen digitally on a screen, allowed me to look much more closely at these surfaces than I'd been able to previously by eye. And to me, the resulting images then seemed to take on a different life. And this led me to work on the surfaces of the photographs that I produced. And I was particularly drawn to the pictures Ken had taken of Hazel. From the letters in the archive, I'd learned that after Hazel had accepted Ken being transgender, in the privacy of the home, Ken was a woman, 
but in public he was a man. Each time I returned to the photographs Ken had taken of Hazel, I came to the same conclusion, that Ken most likely identified with the image that he saw through the lens, that he probably wanted to be Hazel. He probably wanted to wear that dress, that hat, those shoes, those gloves, and in particular to be allowed to be and to be seen by others in public in accord with the way in which he saw himself. And in response to the pictures that Ken took of Hazel and thinking about the surfaces of the vintage prints, I produced a new set of photographs from the originals. And I then began by working on the surfaces of the prints themselves, the ones I'd made, not the originals, I should say, using inks, paint, and magic markers and correction fluid to isolate the clothing. And I experimented with different ways of working on the prints using various silver, black and white drawing and painting materials. Some of the surfaces ended up becoming very thick with layers of ink and paint and scratching and rubbing back through to the earlier layers. And these painted photographs range in size from three inches by four inches to 40 inch by 50 inches. And this picture is relatively small, about eight inch by 10 inches. Whereas the picture you see here is much larger, it's 40 inches by 50 inches. And in, in other reworkings of the pictures Ken had taken of Hazel, I used collage and physically cut or tore and reconfigured the prints. I also worked digitally to create fictional photographs of Ken, trying to imagine how he might have looked as a woman and the wedding proofs became a focus for some of this work. In a second stage of working with the photographs that Ken took of Hazel, I digitally combined some of the environments and clothing in the photographs with photographs of Ken. And from these files, I then made digital negatives so that I could print from them. And the studio that had taken Ken and Hazel's wedding photographs had offered a hand coloring service. And because of this, I decided to use hand coloring on black and white prints. I'd also always loved the look of hand colored photographs, the way that this process often seemed to make the pictures appear otherworldly or hyperreal. And these fictional photographs that I made placed Ken in the settings in which he'd photographed Hazel, in one sense allowing Ken then to be seen in public as a woman. And this picture is rather different to the previous hand-coloured pictures in that it isn't based on a photograph taken by Ken of Hazel. Instead, it's based on a photograph that was taken in Edinburgh in 1960 presumably by my father. And in the photograph is Hazel, Ken, and Audrey. In the digital file for this picture, I merely changed Ken's image to become more feminine by working with the clothing and hair and makeup. I showed earlier on in this talk one of the photographic proofs from Ken and Hazel's wedding and mentioned that the word proof interested me in the context of this archive and also in the context of the family photograph albums. So I'd now like to return to this idea. Looking at the family photographs and the letters together, it seemed to me that in one hand I was holding an emblem of what in the case of transgender people, a conventional family photograph album allowed, and that was the erasure of the transgender life. And in the other hand, I was holding evidence of the experiences that would have been erased. And it made me think about how family albums, in one sense, are creations, they're fictions of family histories. They often present an idealized version of the family with photographs taken at weddings, birthdays, anniversaries, holidays, and celebrations. And the everyday life of the family is rarely represented and photographs aren't usually taken or kept of the discord and difficulties. The lack of recorded transgender family histories can be explained by these kinds of erasures, the editing out of the issue of transgenderism from family albums and memorabilia. I 
I made a second set of digital negatives of fictional images of Ken, specifically so that I could work with chemigram process, processes in the darkroom. Chemigrams allowed me to paint with the developer fix and photographic bleach. And this then meant that I could explore bringing the image out of the surface of the paper itself through the marks I made, rather than apply marks to the surface of a previously printed picture. And I'd like to return now to consider the theme of this conference and the title Fast Forward, Women in Photography, in relation to this project. And I'd like to suggest that this project, Can To Be Destroyed, intersects with the conference title in three ways. First, there are the photographs of Hazel. Her image is that of a woman captured through photography. Secondly, I mentioned earlier that Ken was a man in public and a woman in the home. From Hazel's letters, I learned that Ken had felt very uncomfortable having to present himself as a man. The word that was used was that he felt that he was masquerading as a man. And this led to Ken avoiding being in public places and avoiding social interactions as much as possible. I'm aware that throughout this talk, I refer to Ken as he, and as a man, and as Ken. However, the evidence in this archive suggests that this wasn't how he saw himself. And so although I've done this, it's been so as to be able to discuss this work more simply, and so as not to confuse things with terminology. But I feel that I do really need to say that in order to be politically correct and in accord with the way in which we articulate tra transgender identities today, I should probably be referring to Ken with a female name and using the terms woman and she rather than man and he. I often use the initial K rather than Ken when I'm talking or writing about this project. And when spoken, the initial K sounds like the female name K, K-A-Y. And I also often use the term she rather than he and her rather than him. And so I'm going to continue now by doing this and hopefully in doing so shift the perspective of the person that's at the centre of this story. Considering that in her lifetime Kay was only able to be a woman behind closed doors and had to masquerade as a man in public, one of the things I've wanted to do with this project was to give Kay a freedom that she was unable to have when alive. Whilst that freedom perhaps wasn't possible in the 1950s, 1960s, even 70s or 80s in Scotland, it is much more possible now. And I'd like to suggest that the photographs that Kay took of Hazel also connect with the theme of women in photography, if one takes into account how Kay saw herself. And I think it's really fitting in the current context of our changing understandings of gender diversity and some of the ways in which we are now beginning to gain a better understanding of what it actually means to be a woman or a man. Thirdly, there's also my work with this archive. As a queer photographer, I identify with the figure of Kay, and it's been an important journey for me to try to visualize the figure of Kay in the context of my family. And so there's also a sense of fast forward for me from then to now. <laughs> 